I'm Jason Sylvia, and this is The Creative Capital Show. A show about creative people and how those creative people turn into entrepreneurs by taking their creativity and turning it into a business and facing all the trials and tribulations along the way. Musician, label owner, photographer, residential real estate developer. These are just some of the things this episode's guest, Jason Sheckman, has done throughout his life. Jay's past is an interesting one, much like the past of his current business, Cortland Club. During a chance real estate deal, Jay dug through the state archives to look up the history of a building he would purchase. What he found was a place that was once home to many bakeries, and soon after, multiple social clubs throughout the 50s and 60s. This gave Jay an idea for a new type of social club, one that he would want to hang out at, and one that had an eye towards inclusivity rather than exclusivity. That idea turned into one of the most welcoming establishments in the entire city of Providence, a place where you could meet with friends and have a drink, listen to DJs spin music from different eras, and even have a locker with your favorite spirits inside. To quote a friend of mine during his first visit, every neighborhood should have their own version of Cortland Club. But the story goes beyond opening a bar. It's a story about neighborhoods, about community, about creating a space you would want to be in. And it's a story about looking to the past to inspire the future. Now, this episode covers a lot, so if you want to hear just about Cortland Club, skip to about 33 minutes in. But... I would listen to the whole thing if I were you, because it's one hell of a journey. Enjoy. It's not overselling. I mean, I I think it is, but that's just just me. But for those, for for the people outside of maybe Providence, for the people who have never been um, to your establishment, which we're going to get into in a l- in a little bit, uh, who are you? For the people who don't know, or maybe they just didn't listen to the intro of the show, which would make no sense. I don't know how you got <laughs> to this point. Really quickly, uh, who are you, and uh, what do you what do you do? Yeah, I'm Jason Sheckman. Most of my friends call me Jay. Um, I uh, let's see, Cancer Sun, Scorpio Moon, Leo Rising. Um, I'm the founder and director of Cortland Club in Providence, which is a cocktail bar. Um, and yeah, that's why I'm. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But my, my, my first question, uh, we're going to go back all the way back, back in the time. No, uh, we're going to go back a bit though. If you could take me back to 1999. Okay. And you were in college and you started a group called time machine some friends of yours this is true if you could take me back to that time and just the beginnings of that group because i i think at least in my humble opinion that may inform the other things that we get to later on in the conversation yeah inevitably it does um what do you want to know about it uh more like how the group formed and how long you were making music or not making music up until that point because you did some pretty important stuff like you were in I think you guys were in XXL Mag at the Source. You worked with Greg Nice. You got Ed OG on maybe Master Ace. I think I also on a couple of tracks. Started your own label, which I wonder if that was like technically your first business because you were on Land Speed. Yeah. I do my research, people. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've always loved music since I was a little kid, and um, I, I started making some of my own. I guess in I, I don't know was it even high school i guess i started in my like trying to write stuff in junior high school and in high school and then um in college started actually recording some music uh, with a friend who i made in high school and then i went to college at the george washington university in dc because you're a providence native right i was born in providence at women and infants hospital and then my mom and i moved to miami when i was five and i mostly grew up there oh okay yeah um so, yeah, I went to college in D.C., and 
uh, I had this group of friends, and one of my friends was this guy, Lee Braxton, who's from Baltimore. Um, and he had a close friend from home named Frank, who went to Howard University, which is also in, in D.C. And then, you know, our two, like, our friend group at GW and his friend group at, at Howard ended up hanging out. And through that, I met um, Eric Latham, who uh, became we became fast friends but we also um he just liked what i was doing uh playing around with music stuff so i was working on this one song um in i don't know when this was i guess it was 1999 uh, if you, you 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 might know better than me um, <laughs> 99 or 2000 and then um uh dj mechalek who is a uh, an old friend of mine and um you know one of the more kind of uh, well-known and respected um, DJs and producers out f from Rhode Island. Um, I would definitely agree with that statement. Yeah. Also, in it, I think inadvertently sold me my first turntable. Oh. I still have. Oh, all right. Which is which is hilarious. Because he was playing at Cortland Club and I saw him. Yeah. And he was like, dude, I think I might have actually still That might have been my techniques that, That's that you wild. bought. That's funny. Um, so anyways, he was visiting me in D.C. to work on the music with me. And then Eric... Um, who came to me known as Chomel, which I guess mispronounced all the time because it's spelled weird or spelled in a way that you wouldn't expect it to be. But it, it means um, cute in Malaysian because we knew this girl named Farah who he was friends with, who was from Malaysia and gave him that name. Anyway, he was uh, he came he was over to to just like hang out and see what we were doing and we were trying to finish the song and we couldn't. I didn't know what to do with it, and then he just started like rapping and like, ha and had this whole verse that just um, thematically and and uh, stylistically just worked perfectly, and it made me so happy because it's somebody I've been friends with for a few years but hadn't engaged with in this way, and you know he completed that song, and then after that like all, all I only wanted to make music with him and not you know and that that's and that's how the group started and um, then. Uh, Following that, I guess probably a few months later. Oh, so then they're right. There was, you, you mentioned Landspeed. Landspeed is or was a uh, record, an independent record distributor based in Boston. Um, and there was a guy that worked there who's actually a Rhode Islander named Mig, um, who who had a history at ninety point three FM. This is getting way too detailed, so edit as you need to. But um, See, I keep this stuff in because I find uh, it interesting. Now, if you're outside of R Rhode Island or Providence, because just in case you're listening, we'll try to we'll try to explain references as we go. But I think WRIU is that is ninety point three. That's the that's also a college station, just not the college station you went to, if I'm remembering right, correctly. Right. So yeah, University of Rhode Island is ninety point three WRIU. Um, so anyway, the dude Mig had a history there, and then he ended up going on to work in you know music business, worked at Landspeed. And he heard some of the music I was making, and he wanted to put out a record of mine. And I was like, "Well," and he had he had put out a record with Sage Francis, who's you know a well known Rhode Island guy. Um, and um, so he wanted to put out a record. And I was like, "Well, only if it's this record. If only if it's this, like this project, is what I'm interested in doing." Which came to be known as Time Machine. And he, he was resistant at first because I don't know. I thought he, I guess he thought he could market something else better. But then ended up putting it out and uh it was what was the first one i think the first record was called rest stop sweetheart which was like this story about you know if you drive up and down i-95 there's the rest stops like in um and this was like a thing at the time because i was going to school in dc and and you know i would my my roommate my college roommate was from the bronx so i would go home and hang out with him on the weekends sometime when he went there you know when he went home or i had friends from philly or, or to come back up here you know so you're driving through um, uh, whatever in Connecticut or, or or New Jersey, and there's all these rest stops, and I, I don't know, it was kind of this comedic tale about like looking for love and like falling in love with somebody who worked in a fast food, you know, spot in the rest stop, and so it was that, and then there was a song called A Million and One Things to Do, and then I think uh, Block Trooping, which was the first song I was talking about before that we'd made together, was on there, um, and so they put it out on. Uh, they had this label called Emerge, which was distributed by Landspeed. And I think at some point Landspeed changed its name to Traffic. But so they, they pressed it on 12-inch vinyl, which was commonplace at this time. And um, 
it ended up doing much better in terms of sales and demand than they expected, and particularly in Japan. Um, it really popped off and, and a couple other places. Um, and so when it came time to get paid for this record, um, there was no money. So instead of... Huh, so it sells well. Yeah. And yet when it's like, oh, hey, hey, we, we know it's selling well. Um, can I have my money, please? And they're like, there is no money. Yeah, more or less. So Interesting. Um, which ended up being fine because, you know, I don't even know what the contract would have paid us, you know, it... Um, but what we ended up negotiating in lieu of that money was to get essentially the blueprint for putting out our own records. You know, I, I was like, all right, well, tell me where you manufacture. Tell me, you know, give me the, the contacts for all the distributors. Um, so, so basically, this ended up becoming much more valuable than, you know, the whatever 20 or 20 grand we would have gotten or something so was it just the information or was it the relationships because i feel like internet was around at that time but it's not like today when you have google and you can instantly find like any distributor to or find that truth, kind of information like i'm just curious mm, about that i'm guessing uh, since i was you know obviously naturally a little salty about the financials i'm sure i asked like all right give me the the, the name phone number email address of the person and you know we had the the success of that record under our belt so it was easy to contact them and be like hey you know this record that you just sold and reordered well um we're going to be putting out the forthcoming one so we should be in touch so that we could do this and you know that ended up being much more useful than the little bit of bread we would have got and then um you know, we started uh, we started a, an independent record label, not knowing. I mean, I, most of the things I've done in my life, I didn't know how to do until I started doing them. And Just learning by doing. Learning by doing. And so that record label was named Glow in the Dark, if I'm not mistaken? Glow in the Dark Records, which was uh, Mech's name uh, that he came up with. He likes anything that glows in the dark, so it's like Glow in the Dark Records. And, uh, yeah, you know, we had um, uh, some... some um, some visual artists in Philadelphia who made our logo and did our initial um, cover cover art, um, and we so then we started you know putting out these records and I don't know we would it was all twelve inch vinyl at the time you know we would sell between I guess like five and ten thousand units of each one um, uh, we had distributors in you know. U.S., Japan, Australia. I don't remember how Europe worked, um, but it kind of became a thing, and it coincided with me finishing college. So when I graduated college, at first I got a job at a travel agency in like walking distance of my apartment, and um, I also that like catered to students, and I also had like a job at a movie theater, and you know these these weren't things that were a, particularly a personal interest, but it was a job paying the bills, paying the bills. And um, then, uh, yeah, we started putting out the records and, and um, learning by doing, and it went well. Were you putting out music digitally at the time, just um, just to get kind of a notion of like t this this time, this era of music, or was everything really mostly... Because I remember seeing the music video for uh, A Million One Things to Do Online, but mm -hmm. this is not, like, YouTube didn't exist yet. It was on, like, I think UGHH.com or something was, like, showing the video. But. Yeah, the internet was a very different place. I don't know if streaming legal, like, paid, or, well, streaming services like uh, Spotify and Tidal and Apple Music were not a thing. iTunes, I don't yeah, know Yeah, maybe when in its iTunes infancy. I, I know Napster was around, but it was, yes, that was uh, exactly. not ne necessarily legal. You wouldn't. Yeah. You would not want to put your music on there. <laughs> so digital music wasn't so much a thing. Um, but yeah, so so we just kept going with that. And we, the first few records we put out were Time Machine Records. And then in 2004, I think, we put out the first full-length Time Machine record, which was called Slow Your Roll. And that did well. Um, got a lot of, um, I don't know, it was, was well responded to. And it allowed us to, you know, to travel off of it. We um, went to Japan, went to Australia. Um traveled all around the u.s and canada and uh it was fun now did you end up moving out to la what led to that yeah so all right so after i graduated or, or you know i stayed in dc for maybe six months after finishing school and then um i had a girlfriend at the time who i met in amsterdam because i had done a, a semester abroad there and she was in santa cruz california and she um 
she was like one semester behind me in school. So I was like, you know, I, I was ready to move out of DC. I didn't have any real restrictions on, you know, what, what was next for me. So she's like, well, why don't you come out here while I finish my semester? She's like, just, you know, stay in my apartment and do what you want. And I was like, okay, that sounds wonderful. And I had, um, I had never, I think I'd been to San Francisco once, but I hadn't been anywhere else in California and I, um, hadn't, um, I hadn't traveled much at all except for, you know, having that, that time in, in Europe that we were just talking about. So, uh, I got out there and yeah, um, it's kind of posted up, got to know it, um, made some fr lo friends locally, started kind of like promoting some shows there. Um, and you know, I was working on music there. I was like teaching myself to make beats with the MPC 2000 XL. Um, and <clears throat> then we moved to Oakland, California, because her family had basically an abandoned house there that we got to live in for free if we fixed it up. So we, you know, and by fix it up, I mean like not actual contract or stuff, just like kind of cosmetic and very basic functional things. So it was cool. We were living in Oakland. I was, and you know, I, I was, uh, I just had like a road bike. I didn't, we didn't, I didn't have a car. I think she had a car and I would, you know, it was right next to Berkeley. So I ride into Berkeley, go to the record stores, buy records. Um, you know, I was what, 21 years old or whatever. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. And, and, uh, yeah, as, as I look back on it, the, the sequential aspect of like, you know, what exactly happened in what orders, I'm sure I could figure it out, but off the rip, I'm like, I can't picture it, but yeah, it was just, uh, it was there for a little bit. And then she got into film school at AFI in Los Angeles. Um, she, she came from a family of, of a famous filmmaker and, and pursue, chose to pursue that path too. Um, for some reason when she was going to LA, I just like, I didn't want to go to LA. And also I did want to work on more time machine music. I wanted to make that album. Cause were you the only one out there or was everybody from time was, machine? So out I was out there. So this is pre LA. This is in, gotcha. in the Bay, Santa Cruz then Oakland. And then, so I came back to Providence actually. Oh, okay. And I, uh, rented a house in, in Washington park, like off of broad street right near, um, Roger Williams Park uh, had two roommates, um, and and then uh, we put together a little makeshift studio in the basement, and um, yeah, and, th and that's where we recorded the the Time Machine album. Gotcha. Um, and so, yeah, um, we recorded Ed O G for that song, uh, "Mind in a Spin." It's called um, Ed O G. For those who don't know, is a one of the kind of most uh, famous and important rappers from Boston. He's from Roxbury. Um, very historically significant uh, dude. And honestly, I don't remember how we met him, but we did the song with him. And then we did a song with Idan, um, which we were actually, we were, he was living in Boston at the time because he had gone to Berkeley School of Music. And um, we recorded that at his apartment in Boston. But yeah, so 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 um, Eric, a.k.a. Chamel, was, was still living in D.C., but he would come up and, you know, stay for a week or two at a time and we would work on the songs. And then basically we finished the album I uh, had a line cook job for a little while. Um, I think I had like a, I think I did some like office assistant work. Um, and then we, when we finished the album, we moved to LA and uh, all together. And or I went out first, and I found a, a house for us. And then um, er, uh, Eric and Matt Mech and um, our other friend Mike, who did some of the production for us and who directed that Million and One Things to Do video you were just talking about, all gotcha. moved out. And we, we had this house in um, uh, East Hollywood, um, Silver Lake. And it was it was a wonderful time. So that time, I'm just curious of like, what lessons did you learn, right? Because you did those first couple sig singles, not yeah. singles, singles. Um, and... You know, all of a sudden it's like, hey, where's the money? And then you're like, okay, I can maybe fight for the money, but l instead let me leverage the knowledge and the relationships to do my own thing. Yeah. And then you're also working at the same time, you're running your own label. And then, you know, you do get you get some success, of, like as far as like the re positive reviews in XXL, positive reviews in the source. Um, I think you were opening for people under the stairs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that came after. Uh, oh, okay. That came, well, actually, so uh, before. Damn, it's, it, it's funny. I haven't thought about a lot of these things in a long time. But um, 
people under the stairs, the way I, I met Double K, rest in peace, with people under the stairs um, on a trip out to visit LA before actually moving there. Just like uh, some somebody who was kind of showing us around was friends with him. So he, you know, went by his house and I met him there, but that was just kind of like an isolated thing. Then fast forward after we're there, I guess it must have been, you know, I th we moved there in 2003. So I think at some point in probably 2005, um, we, we had become friends with these kids in a group called Giant Panda who was affiliated with People Under the Stairs. And People Under the Stairs was putting together a tour um, that uh, we did uh, We did uh, three or four tours with them. So I don't remember which one the first one was. But essentially they determined that they needed another opening act. So Alex Newman, who was in this group, Giant Panda, recommended us and Thess of People Under the Stairs. Um, uh, you know, greenlit it and took us on tour. And then, you know, we became very, very close friends, very dear friends with them. And yeah, they were, you know, they, 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 we call them our, you know, they're, they're our big brothers basically, um, or our stepfathers, we call them. So, uh, yeah, they, they took us on, a, a, you know, one nationwide tour, US and Canada tour. They took us over a regional West Coast tour. They took us to, England, Switzerland, Scotland, they were, they looked out for, you know, they, they didn't need us, but they, they looked out for us because they liked having us around and because they needed somebody to open up. So it might as well be their friends. So what did, what did you learn from like, just that whole experience of like, put like getting the leverage of the relationships, putting out your own music, mm -hmm. running your own label to put out the music, still working at the same time. Then you're like, okay, we're going to make this move. We're going to do this together. Mm -hmm. And then you you know you you hook up with your with your you know you, you get the uh, the relationship with uh, your stepfathers as you put it <laughs> yeah. just now, you're touring you're doing all this which must have been a whirlwind whirlwind for somebody at like that age and at that yeah. time. Um, what were like some of like the more I don't want to say creative lessons because like that could be a whole other podcast to be honest with you. But what sure. were some of, like the business things you learned of just about like the business of touring and then, like the business of like. Oh, like you have you have to like recoup the expenses of like mm -hmm. getting something pressed and then putting that music out. Like, what were some of the, those those like first base business lessons you learned then that have stuck with you to now? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that there's lots of kinds of currency that that money isn't the only kind of currency. Would you say leverage would be one of them? Um. Well. Well, the one that more specifically, it's like if we would have got off that first twelve inch record. If we would have, I don't, you know, I don't even know what the math would have been that we would have been owed, but I'm guessing maybe it would have been 20 grand, 15, $20,000, something like that, you know, and then to be split like by three people. And then, you know, it would, it's, after taxes and all that stuff too. Yeah, yeah. It would make no impact on my life, but to, in lieu of that, to get the, um, the information and the resources, um, you know, enabled us to do everything we did afterwards for years to come and to, to grow on it. So, you know, obviously money is a, 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 the reality of, of living in the society we do. We need money to get by. But, you know, if you're able to, um, you know, see value in other things and, and uh, particularly things that um, position you for growth and whatever it is you're trying to grow in, then that might be worth it more than a little bit of money, you know? Um, so that, that's a big one that comes to mind. You know, and any other lesson is is pretty textbook stuff, like golden rule stuff. You know, treat gotcha. people the way you want to be treated. You know, try to be open minded. Um, and it's hard to do that sometimes, particularly if you're in your early mid twenties and maybe a little inexperienced and possibly a little hot headed. And you know, um, you know, just try not to be short sighted. You know, these are. So I, I don't know how well I'm answering your questions because other than the first thing that I said, they're not business specific, so to speak. But um, if if you can kind of like uh, apply that to to what you're doing, it'll probably you know serve you well. I think those are some good some good lessons right there. Yeah. What led you What led you back to to Providence? Because something must have. Sure. So what led you back to Providence from LA and from this touring life and yeah. this this music life that you were living? So the the label continued to grow. At first, we were only putting out the Time Machine records, but then, like you said, we put out uh, the first Ed O G and Master Ace collaboration record, and they ended up doing more stuff together after that. But you know, those are two kind of hip hop legends that we listened to growing up and and looked up to and uh you know it, it was pretty amazing to be able to put that together if you're a boston person it's like oh my god yeah and master ace you know is a um 
you know, New York rapper from, uh, he was part of the Juice Crew, which is like Big Daddy Kane, you know, uh, Roxanne Shante, Biz Marquis, like very important classic stuff. And he actually has a Rhode Island tie too. He was a University of Rhode Island alumni, Mass Days. That I didn't know. Yeah. I, I do know about Mass Days and the, and the New York connection and then yeah. teaming up with somebody legendary from Boston, but I did not know he had a URI connection. That's interesting. Yep. And um, we put out a record called Zimbabwe Legit, which was a record that had been recorded I think in the early 90s and never saw the light of day because there was this label called Hollywood Basic, which is the label that Organized Confusion first came out on, that um, the the dude, like the label head was this guy, uh, Dave Dave Klein or, or Funkin' Klein. And um, he had, you know, had this little boutique hip hop label on under Hollywood Records, but he had some health issues. And uh, my understanding is that he passed away, I hope. Well, we should fact check that, and the you know the label basically ceased to exist. Um, but uh, DJ Shadow, I think, was affiliated as well. Anyways, so there was this record that never saw the light of day that was recorded for this, and it had a DJ Shadow production. It had a production from Mr. Long, a Black Sheep, um, and I, through, by way of somebody that I had met through this whole web of independent music world you know i got the opportunity to release this unreleased record so we did that um and yeah it started we we did this uh put out something with this group called panacea which is these washington dc based guys and um we ended i ended up meeting raucous the guys who run raucous records which was kind of like at the forefront of the like late 90s early 2000s um you know, indie hip hop world. Yeah, because I was gonna say at that time, like the in, like indie hit, like I want to say at its peak, but like indie hip hop was, you could see like a raucous yeah. records like music video on MTV next right. to like Rockefeller. Yeah. Like, so video. if for people who know who Run the Jewels is, um, you know, like uh, Company Flow is, is LP's original group. Like that's yeah. the type of group that was affiliated. Definitive with the label. Jux. Yeah, Def yeah, Jux. yeah. Right. And so that that's that comes after Raucous. Anyway. But we ended up getting this distribute, you know, kind of partnership deal with Rockus. So these things kept growing, and then you know through that there was a distribution and a Sony subsidiary. So the things kept growing and growing. Meanwhile, um, the 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 music, the way that music business worked changed. And that you know you asked before about digital music. This is when kind of um, streaming really came to. To, to the forefront and the the ways to monetize it which still are you know problematic didn't really um emerge yet for like you know itunes sales and, and this and that so it was just like our whole business model of you know okay we're gonna make music we're gonna press it on vinyl we're gonna sell seven eight thousand of them and then we're gonna do another and we're gonna do another and we're gonna make an lp and we're gonna tour off it like that very very quickly became not a viable way to do things and you know we're we're resourceful and resilient and we could have kind of tried to figure out what next what was next but more importantly just a lot of things were happening that were making it not fun anymore and so it went from being this like what a coup to be able to do you know what i want and and focus on these kind of creative things and find an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial angle for it to being something that was like kind of felt like resentful or, or something that definitely not soul satisfying so it just felt like time for a change and at that so this is like i don't know 2009 or something um i decided i want to make a change so i would have stayed i would have definitely considered staying in la or staying in music business i kind of reached out to people i knew through different parts of my life whether it was friends or family or or um you know, kind of business colleagues. And I was like, look, you know me, you know how I do things, you know, you know what some of my strengths are. You know, you have any opportunities, you need something, somebody to kind of do for you. Mm -hmm. And by way of that, the thing that kind of struck me as most interesting and lucrative and definitely way outside of my experience and, uh, and wheel, you know, wheelhouse was um, a real estate related thing in New England. And that was going to be more, one of my later questions because yeah. I read that you you were in real estate and I was like, when did that happen? That's that's, that's when that's when that happened. Um, and so I moved to Boston, um, and 
I didn't like living in Boston very much, but I was there for like, you know, I, I kind of purposely avoided Providence because it felt too small and too familiar. And um, I, so I moved to Boston and I didn't like it very much. So when um, my lease was up, I moved to Providence. So got back to Providence. And one thing I want to ask you about, because not only were you creative in the sense of music, um, but also apparently photography. I think I'm looking at some of your <laughs> photography here. Yeah, there's some, yeah, I took this photo. Because um, um, you had a exhibition called The Only Time I'm Here, and I think you released a book, uh, Hang Ups Follow You Like Shadows. Wow, you so, do do your research. Yeah, um, you, got some, you got some praise from uh, uh, Mr. Jamal Shabazz. Jamal so. Shabazz, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so, right. So the the kind of evaluation when I decided to do this real estate work was, all right, I don't have anything. I had just spent, you know, my entire adult life after finishing school doing exactly what I wanted to do on my own terms. And it, it you know, it was it was a wonderful experience, but it took me to this place where I didn't really want to do it anything and do it anymore and I didn't have something else that I really wanted to do instead. So I was like, all right, well let me take this opportunity, you know, rock with it, see what happens, see where it takes me. And once I figure out, once I know what it is I do want to do next, I'll be, you know, maybe have a little bit of money in the bank, which I had no money at, at all at that point. Um, you know, it was great that we were able to uh, cover our living expenses, pay everybody's rent and other bills off of music, but it's not like we were saving money or anything. So, um, you know, and then let me do this for a while. And then when there's something else I want to do, then I'll transition to that. So, um lost my train of thought photography ah okay so so yeah so one thing that was cool about this situation was that you know it, it allowed me a little bit of bandwidth and time to do other things so you know I, we continue to do some music stuff like kind of more casually and peripherally and then at some point i really um discovered that i enjoyed taking photos and this was you know pre-instagram um which honestly instagram is kind of what made me stop being interested in taking photos but uh goddamn digital uh, world uh, making changes well i was taking digital <laughs> photos i wasn't shooting film i was i had what's called a um a micro four, four thirds camera or a mirrorless camera so okay i enjoyed kind of like a street photography approach and part of what i think um sets you up to get good street photos is being discreet so what's cool about these cameras is they shoot really lovely photos but they're very compact because they don't have mirrors in them so you're allowed to you know there's a there's a saying like you know kind of shooting from the hip which you know has i guess a couple of meanings but in in photography terms it's like it's it's almost like literally like not holding the camera up to your eyes it's like holding this thing by your pocket and and shooting um so i was taking photos like that and i was doing it for fun and i think i had a um a tumbler yeah, i had a tumbler i would put some photos on and then um i got i was working in um I was a, a production assistant or something on a uh, on a music video shoot in Dominican Republic, and I took uh, we went you know so it was cool we had access to like going all sorts of kind of off the beaten path places in DR, and um, we were in I think it was San Pedro, and there was this cool looking kid this real cool looking young kid um, on a like on a BM like a, a sky blue BMX in a like red, like, you know, short sleeve collared shirt. This looked so cool. And I asked him if I could um, take his photo and he said, yeah. And I, um, it, it ended up being like probably my favorite photo I had taken to date. And then, um, but it, I, I was very aware that it was very much in the style of Jamel Shabazz, who is kind of known as the iconic kind of, uh, photographer of hip hop fashion and, and street fashion of, you know, the, the seventies, eighties and eighties. Um, and, you know, I printed a few of them and I had like one extra print that, you know, that I, I had, uh, you know, given them to some friends and I think sold them on the Tumblr and I had one left and I was like, you know what? And I just found like Jamel Shabazz's PO box on the internet. And I just, I'd sent him a print and I was like, Hey, it was kind of out of the blue, but um, big fan of your work. And this photo of mine feels like it was very strongly and directly in influenced by your work. So, you know, I, I, here's the photo. I, I hope you like it. And then I, I guess I must have put my phone number in because, like, fast forward, you know, 
a month or two or three and um I had a phone call and it was Jamel Shabazz and he was just like so enthusiastically uh, in love with the photo and, and appreciative that I had sent it. And then he ended up like kind of mentoring me for a while. I ended up shooting a portrait of his that uh, he told me it was hanging in his daughter's room. Um, and, I, you know, we've since fallen out of touch. But yeah, that was just a thing for a while. I think, you know, I it was just a fun creative outlet for me. And then, um, you know, I, I was using Tumblr kind of the way that people use instagram now gotcha okay and um and and then so when it became a thing that like we all started doing then i just didn't want to do it anymore i don't know you're like, you're like all right i'm gonna head out <laughs> kind of <laughs> so you do music you do you know the photography and you got the real estate going yeah um what made you say to yourself because now we're getting we're getting into we're getting into like the the i guess the the meat, the meat of the story here. Okay. What made you go, you know what I want to do now? I want to start a bar. Like I did not want to start okay. a bar. So it wasn't just like, hey, I want to start a bar. No, you know, I think in my mind I had this notion that when I'm, you know, older, when, I, when I'm in my 50s or 60s or whatever, um, that I would, I would love to have like a little restaurant bar type thing that I would just do exactly what I wanted to do and then those who liked it could come there and, you that know. was more for like your retirement kind of years. Yeah, like and it wasn't kind of a business thing. It was like this kind of like romanticized notion of this very like kind of self-serving, casual thing that I, it wasn't a fully formed thought. Your own version of Cheers, so to speak? No, no not, not my own version of Cheers. <laughs> if anything, closer to like, uh, I don't know, some like, you know, off the beaten path, like little tropical shack on a beach or something there you go anyway that's a hell of an image yeah yeah i'd be into that right now um but so what happened was i was doing um uh i was restoring multi old beat up multi-family houses in providence on the west side of providence uh, doing some on carpenter street and then i moved over to Cortland street to start working on stuff and or maybe i was just on carpenter at this point and um there was this building that that nobody wanted to have anything to do with because it was weird and it wasn't very attractive. And um, the first floor had been a um, a social club, uh, like an Italian American men's social club. Um, and you know, it was kind of had I don't know how many years had passed since it had actually been in use, but it had like you know like a chain link gate on it. it had like the windows were blocked off can you explain briefly like what those kind of social clubs were just for anybody listening who absolutely doesn't have like an idea of what that was especially back in in their heyday yeah so i, I i've learned a lot about them since but so this um basically you know and this is probably true to others like uh chronologically but the ones in this space um showed up around the end of world war ii and basically you know people were coming back from the war and they had you know they were trying to you know, they were looking for ways to have a social life and spend their time so like you know these guys would go to this place and play cards and drink beer and get away from their wives and you know and have banquets once in a while and you know i think that there's a, a whole gamut of them and a lot of them were on kind of ethnic lines you know like in that area primarily italian but Still to this day, there's in Rhode Island, there's a, you know, there's Portuguese clubs, there's a German club in Pawtucket, there's plenty of others. So, so that you know, the other thing to that's worth mentioning is that you know, pre mid twentieth century white flight out of you know cities in general, but more specifically Providence in this neighborhood, there were a lot of um, f you know ground floor. So if you're looking at these multifamily houses or these tenement houses, a lot of the times the first floor would be a retail space, like a little mom and pop retail space, whether it's a little convenience store or a tailor or whatever it may be. So this was like integral to the fabric of these neighborhoods. And then as people, um, as the people who lived there at the time left the city, that they, a lot, most of them um, gradually were converted into apartments as well. But if you walk around that neighborhood, and you look at the buildings where there's like a diagonal kind of little wall, whether it's a door or a window or whatever it is on the corner, that was likely 
a, a, some type of shop or retail space. So, you know, and, and as um, in this age of, of people having moved back into cities a lot in the past 10 plus years, you know, they're looking for a convenience and they're looking for amenities. So it's like, it's funny how it's kind of like this full circle thing where that's like relevant again. What's, what's old is new again. What's old is new again. And it's actually speaking of that, that retail part, because if I'm not mistaken, and it was funny because the last time I went to Cortland Club, uh, the person I was with, uh, Ashley, who Ashley Ben Nixon, I'm just going to do some shameless cross promotion. Go listen to her episode after this one. Um, but uh, her and I were were there, and she was making a note of the. Um, we were near like the brick wall towards the back, making yeah. a note of the ovens because yeah. before it was a social club. I think it was there uh, were bakeries there. Yeah, it was a bakery pizzeria or something like that. Yeah, in the 1920s and 30s, there were bakeries there. So you know, if you're a Rhode Islander, you know Crignali Bakery, which is known for the um, you know the pizza strips, the and or bakery pizza people call it as well. So they were there in 1928, and there were um, some other ones. There was one called. Uh, public service bakery. There was a couple others too, which are escaping my memory. The names of which are escaping my memory right now. But so yeah, it was bakeries and then it was social clubs. And so, anyways, there was this building, and I think the the fact that this the first floor main space was this kind of beat up non residential space within the middle of a residential neighborhood turned people off and they just didn't know what to make of it or what to do with it. Meanwhile, there is a fully like move in ready apartment upstairs from it. So were you rehabbing the entire building at the time or were you just planning on rehabbing that bottom part or? So I wasn't doing anything at the time. The oh, point okay. is that no, well, I was doing other houses. The point is nobody wanted this building and this building was cheap. It was a price, you know, it was the, it's public record if you want to find out, but the, it was a price of like a of a of a luxury car basically. And they were turned off just because of that bottom retail part, even though there was the apartment up top. Yeah, that's and, interesting. And the truth is, it would be easy and arguably smarter to just convert that space into an apartment if that's what somebody's business model is or what they want to do, or if they're just looking to keep it moving instead yeah. of getting involved in something. But you know that I became fascinated. So, anyways, I ended up buying this place, super cheap. Um, uh, and you know, so cheap enough that by, that by renting out the apartment upstairs paid for the cost of the ownership of the building, which gave me the freedom to take my time to figure out what the hell I was doing. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile I was doing like archive, you know, I went to the state archives and I was, you're able to pull up information about, you know, who and what was at any given address at a certain time. So that's how I discovered the history with the bakeries and the social clubs and, um, so I've kind of like started to develop this idea of doing a contemporary version of the social clubs that had been there in the past um, and, you know, kind of elevating the, the quality of the offerings in terms of food and drink and, and um, you know, improving the, the kind of um, atmosphere of it by, um, you know, kind of identifying like what architectural features were, were worth preserving and then what to, you know, kind of design and build around that. And, um, and then also to, you know, have it be something that was for everybody, because that's kind of the one, like, like I was saying before, the one kind of real constant with the social clubs of the past were that they were, you know, for a very specific group of people. Which, I was going to say, there was the line about the guys trying not to be with their, he's like, oh, to get away from their wives and shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was a lot of that. And it was a lot around, along ethnic lines and, and, you know, um, it, so it was about like taking the what was nice about these this place the notion of a place of gathering and the notion of camaraderie but making it f something that was um inviting and accessible for for people of, of all kinds of people so basically almost to like kind of bring it back to music like like a dj or somebody would dig in the crates you were digging in the archives found some cool inspiration mm -hmm. and you're like oh the, this idea of a social club is a really good one and you're like, instead instead of like you were saying before, somebody just rehabbing it and sure. keeping it moving and making it an apartment, you're like, yeah. no, I can do something else with this. Yeah, so I guess I was looking for something to do. <laughs> I was looking for a creative outlet. That's a that's a, that's a hell of a creative. So you have the idea, and you're like, I'm going to do this social club slash bar. And did you have any experience? I, I think you said you were like a little bit before you were a cook. But I like briefly a line cook. No. But other no. than that, like any, in the bar food service I'm, industry. I, no, I mean, I had some event planning experience from like booking – um, some shows and I had right a little bit of um, line cook experience but no and I was very naive as to what it what was involved in doing this I think in my mind it's like all right well 
I just want to make a place that my friends can come hang out once in a while and, um, you know, make it cool. And yeah, we'll have some food and some drink and whatever. And I didn't understand that how much regulation there is and that if, if I wanted it to I'm be, definitely going to be asking about that. <laughs> yeah. If I wanted it to be a thing that was actually like functioning, you know, legally and also, um, open to the public in any respect and all, all these, all, if I wanted to make it a real bar that like I was, that my initial vision of how it was going to work was not. Look to the past to inspire the future. While it seems like today there is always a focus on what's new, many still look to the past for inspiration. Fashion designers will look through vintage pieces. Filmmakers will watch old movies. And DJs will dig through crates for old records. And I get it. Not everything from the past is worth keeping. But there are timeless songs we still sing along to. Movies we can watch hundreds of times. And Nike can release a Jordan 1 Chicago colorway tomorrow and it would probably sell out. When digging through the state archives, Jason drew inspiration from the social clubs of yesterday to create the Cortland Club of today. Jason kept the idea of a joyful gathering place and got rid of the barriers and exclusivity. He did away with the wood paneling and kept the brick walls. He kept the social aspect of a social club while adding his own take on a high-quality nightlife experience. So, look to the past. Do away with what's outdated. Keep what's classic and timeless. And use all of that as inspiration to create something new for you and your audience. Jesse Hedberg from uh, from Local 121, which is an old bar restaurant in downtown Providence. You already you're you're about to get into one of my questions. I was gonna say, how did you how did you and and Jesse meet? Because was he your first hire as far as like the yeah, well, people getting involved? Yeah, absolutely. He was the first person I spoke to about working with on this. Um, I was friends I was friends with uh, with a woman named Lara who is still around here in Providence. Uh, we were we were pretty close friends at this time. And um, so I, she she was a bartender and she also did the music booking at Local 121. So I would go hang out there sometimes. And so I just met Jesse uh, by way of, of going there. And I don't really remember my train of thought as to why I thought he would be the right person to work with. Well, also, if you just, not to cut you off, but could you explain um, Jesse Hedberg as far as like his significance because he's a pretty known made guy when it comes to like cocktails and bartending at, at, within like the Providence area. Yeah, I mean he's definitely has a history of of opening a lot of bars and he's worked at a lot of places and people have you know brought him in to to do to launch these things and now he's one of the owners of Pizza Marvin on Wickenden Street. Um, but yeah, he's a you know he is a true passionate lover of food and drink and flavor and. Um, so uh, something about our, you know, conversations or whatever struck me in a way that I was like, yeah, I want to work with this guy. So I, you know, I showed him the space and I talked about what I was trying to do. And then we kind of developed the idea together and he was very patient because like everything, it took longer than we thought it might to get it going, but that was it. What was, what was like one of the, you know, you, you have the idea, you've got Jeff, you're working with Jesse, which is like good move, right? Good person to bring in mm -hmm. who like really knows that industry, knows that business. Um, what was like one of the first steps as far as like after talking with Jesse, it's like, all right, what was step one? What was that? Because the first step sometimes is the hardest one. But I'm just curious as to like, mm -hmm. what was it for you? Well, step one was tearing apart this this tornado of a building. So and, doing the rehab. Well, so starting the re and not even the rehab, starting the demo by, you know, like the, the, the brick wall and the ovens that you're talking about, like, I didn't even know that was there. There was like wood 1970s, or like faux wood paneling everywhere. And there was drop ceilings, like fluorescent, like drop ceilings, like you would see in a dentist's office. There was linoleum flooring. So we start tearing it apart and like getting rid of this stuff and, you know, finding kind of some of these um, beautiful architectural details. Um, but then I got to a point where I'm like, 
I better pump the brakes because I can't actually start building this place out until I know for sure I'm going to be able to like get a liquor license and do all these things. So the first sp first steps were kind of, you know, moving forward with um, with you know the demo of the space and then developing the idea of what we wanted to do there and then coming to understand all of the moving parts that you know I needed to get you know a green light from the city to actually do this particularly given its um, residential zoning yeah because I was gonna say that that's definitely and I want to talk a, about that a little, little bit later on but um it's definitely an interesting location in the sense that it's not on a main street mm -hmm. it's it's in a it's it's a bar slash business that exists in a residential area which maybe at the time when it was in its heyday made sense but like now it's probably some kind of like zoning nightmare yeah. i would think yeah I, you know i think that 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 um yeah sure the i i'm not aware of the history on how zoning changed but at some point it definitely you know it, there's there's kind of a hierarchy where commercial use is considered uh i think they might even use the word superior to a residential use so it's like gotcha. if you have a commercial space then you know it's it's really i think not much of a big deal to change it into residential but to do reverse is is borderline impossible but this one was well documented you know that it had throughout time never left this commercial use so it allowed us to to pursue what we wanted to do there what were some of the pros and cons that like did you like then as you were getting it started and even I'm wondering now, are there any pros and cons that like, it makes it like a really amazing space. Like it's off, it's off the beaten path. But at the same time, I'm thinking there, like, are there any issues with it being in like more of a residential area that you have to deal with that maybe another bar or restaurant wouldn't have to deal with? Well, I mean, the f first and probably most important was making sure that we were good neighbors. Um, you know, we didn't want to um, disrupt people's, living environment we wanted to be an asset to the neighborhood not a hindrance right um so it was kind of thinking about what does that look like you know how do how wh what does it look like to be to be responsible in that regard and to add value and not take value away um so that was kind of like a, you know not a challenge but well yes a challenge but you know something to really be thinking about um and other than like that footprint, you know, it was more about, yeah, like just kind of logistical things of what the city would and wouldn't allow us to do. What are some of the more like logistical and paperwork costs and things that maybe you didn't know about or you don't think the average person knows about that if somebody was to start a bar like, hey, get these documentations and things done sure. early before because it's going to be a headache later on. Yeah. I remember talking to, about some of this stuff with – um with Joaquin about like, uh, you know, El Rancho Grande back in the day and even Dolores, but what were some of the things that you encountered from like a business legal and paperwork that you're like, oh, I didn't know I had to do this or like even just beyond liquor licenses and like zoning and that kind of stuff. There's just so many insurance policies like that are required, uh, you know, different kind of general liability, liquor liability, you know, other kinds of liability. Uh, so just lots of, you know, there's lots of soft, soft costs, you know, lots of bills. You know, it's a. Uh, I don't. I don't know how many insurance policies we have, but there's a lot. And then you know, on top of that, you have a tangible tax to pay to the city. You have, um, you know, in the case of owning the property, a property tax to pay. Uh, you have sales tax to um, collect and and distribute. Uh, you have, um, you know, utilities of. Uh, you know, water, sewer, electric, gas. It's like, you know, think about your bills that you have at home and then multiply them. And um, so it's like that is all, you know, invisible stuff that nobody gets any enjoyment out of, but it's got to be done. It's got to be done. And, and speaking of going along that line of questioning, right? Because um, you were talking about how the apartment above mm -hmm. was, you were able to rent that out to generate cash that enough money to cover yeah. the the cost of owning the business of, of owning, owning the building. building. Yeah. But I'm guessing you had to raise startup costs or capital to like get these, th these documentation and these licenses and these insurance policies along with like, like you said, doing the demo and rehabbing uh -huh. and um, getting it to what it eventually would be like on opening day. Yeah. Um, so how did you raise that capital? Well, I was just kind of well situated enough through the work that I'd been doing in real estate for the, 
past, um, I don't know how, how much time had lapsed by then, but five years or whatever it was that um, I was able to do that. And then my favorite thing, definitely not my favorite thing in the world, my favorite th thing that I that I discovered in, in by way of learning real estate work was was called a HELOC or which is an ac acronym for home equity line of credit. So basically if you own something and own is such a funny term because unless you paid the bank off, you don't own shit. But um, that is definitely correct. If you own something and it's assessed value or not assessed value, it's appraised value exceeds the um, what you're into it for then you can get a loan for you know that balance or like 80 percent of that balance whatever you know whatever formula the the lender's offering and basically it just it's an account where you can access it whenever you want you don't need like if i wanted to if i had a heloc and i wanted to go to foxwoods and you know put it all on black i could do that and i wouldn't need permission to do it I would not do that. I was, I was, I'm waiting for like yeah. the, the crazy no, I don't, <laughs> Fox I'm not, Woods story. I'm not a gambler. I'm not a gambler at all. Um, but basically the point is it's this amazing asset where if, if the circumstances you know, um, equip you to, to be able to take advantage of it, you can grab money when you need it. And then you just need to be mindful of how you're going to pay it back. And you just the thing that's really cool about it is um, as opposed to other kinds of loans or you're just paying for like if say you had a hundred thousand dollar equity line home equity line of credit but you were only using five thousand dollars out of it you would only be paying interest on that five grand you're not paying it on the rest oh so the rest of it that sits there you're not paying interest or anything exactly. on that. it's gotcha. just like okay. frozen it's this amazing little iceberg waiting for you so i kind of learned that and i really kind of leveraged that and played those games and that's how i was able to kind of maneuver that so Gonna switch gears a little bit. It's gonna be going back and forth between business and creative, but with That's your fine. particular business, they really do intertwine. So I think mm -hmm. this is gonna make sense. Um, you're talking about how like the you know first it was a bakery, then it was a social club, and the idea of the social club. How much did that um, inform Cortland Club? And and by that I mean, if I'm not mistaken, in the very very beginning when you opened, and feel free to correct me on this, was it was it strictly invite only? No, uh, it okay. was never members only. It was never invite only. Um, we had a members program um, to honor the history of the building and to, you know, kind of further this notion of what a social club is. Um, and then, you know, the idea was that the members pro that we're open to the public, we're here for everybody. But if you really like the place and you want to be more involved and more invested, well, then that's what the membership program is for. Gotcha. So, okay. So, you know, and the membership program still exists and the benefits of it, are, you know, there's a nominal annual fee to do it. And you get a free cocktail every month of your choosing. It can be something off the menu or a classic cocktail. You get invitations to um, complimentary wine, beer, and spirit tastings. Uh, which we try to do about one a month that, you know, we'll have the, like a rep from a, a distillery or whatever, come out, tell you about it, taste you on things often like rare stuff that doesn't make it to market. And then if we do um, like special kind of uh, ticketed event, like, you know, we've, we've done this tasting menu series called, called magic hour, or if we have like, a, you know, a, a special guest DJ or some other type of like event going on, then you get first access to, a reservation or a ticket for that before it becomes available to everybody else. So it's, it's a very optional thing, but it's something, you know, it's something that people do because they like it there. Is that how you balance? Because I think it's, I think it's really awesome that you took the, um, just from my perspective, uh, and before I go into this question, I'll, I'll reference something a buddy of mine said he was visiting, um, funny enough from New York, then now he's living in DC because of work. So he was visiting from DC. So everything's coming full yeah, circle. Yeah. But um, I took him to Cortland Club and uh, 
for those that are outside of province who've never been to Cortland Club, there's no sign in the front. It's just residential street and like it's there. And if you know where it is, you know where it is. It's not like it's hidden, hidden. Yeah. But there's no sign saying like it's a bar. It's calling. It's a little more attention to itself now that we have that patio, the outdoor patio, right? Yeah, Before it, the patio, it was like it really oh. blended in, yeah. Because um, I remember uh, that said buddy was like, "Are you going to your friend's house?" I'm like, "No, it's a bar." And he's like, "Where?" And I'm like, "Open the door." He's like, "What the fuck?" Yeah. Um, but as he's looking at everything, and I'm gonna have some questions about this later on he um he's like yo this he's like every neighborhood needs a bar like this he's like this is he's like in my mind this is like the quintessential neighborhood bar he was like i wish every neighborhood had a bar like this this place is amazing and the reason why i'm leading with that which i like he's right um but the idea of the social club as you were saying before back in its heyday were based on certain like Again, certain types of like lines, whether it be ethnic lines, whether it be neighborhood lines, and it was almost like exclusive. And then you turn it on its head because when I go to Cortland Club, it's a very like inclusive, very welcoming space. And then you have the options of membership, mm -hmm. but like you said, you don't have to do the membership. Um, how did like was that just more of like were you intentionally doing that, or is that like an unintentional thing where it's like you took the idea of a social club and you turned it on its head and made it very inclusive and welcoming thing. I mean, everything there is intentional, but it also comes with a lot of trial and error. So and I would, you know, I, I don't hesitate to admit that the membership program has been uh, a source of confusion for a lot of people and has also been the thing that um, it has been hard to put as much kind of uh, time and energy into just because there's always something else happening and you know there's only so many hours in the day but we're actually we've been bringing more attention to it lately but um yeah i mean it was intentional in that like cool if you know we don't right we don't we're not trying to like shut anybody out but if you you know so come through but if, if you happen to you know be if this resonates with you and you want to be a part of this and here's another way to get involved and also it was just honestly a, a, a means of you know how to hit the ground running uh, uh, how to get people in the door immediately was to kind of um reach out to our our personal networks mine jesse's you know a couple other people that were involved from the beginning and and say you know here this is the thing that we're doing like come through and i think yeah so there was i think some initial invited members that were just essentially like people that we each knew and then um, once it got going, then there was the option that people could just come join on their own if that if they wanted to do that. So speaking of people, um, I think sometimes folks when they start a business don't realize at some point they're going to have to hire people. Yeah. And you had to hire people in the beginning because mm -hmm. um, you know you're making food, so you needed a cook. You need somebody to probably do like the host do front of house. You needed bartenders. You need somebody like a, to actually run the bar program and come up with drinks, come up with food items. Um, wh how do you go about hiring? Because I think that's sometimes like a like a thing for people. It's like, oh, I gotta I have to like, if, like find talent and then hire yeah. them and make sure they're a right fit for the business. Um, regardless of whether it was like the first hires then or how you do hiring now, like how did you? Was that a weird thing? It's like, oh, I gotta hire people. Yeah, of course it was weird, and also it was a new thing for me. Um, but you know how people are like don't work with your friends. Like I, I've only worked with my friends like almost always. Um, so, you know, uh, right. Like, so, you know, Jesse and I, I guess we're, we're, um, you know, we're friends now, but we, at the time we were more acquaintances. And then, uh, but other than that, like my friend, uh, you know, he's Richie known as Juan Deuce locally. Um, I went to high school with the guy. Okay. So he's, you know, he's a, he's put out music in, in Providence for years. So he's a, one of my closest friends. So, and he, we used to hang out all the time and he would, he would always be making pizzas and um, he enjoyed it so much. And I was like, Hey, you want to do this? And he's like, okay. And then um, Ignacio Quiles um, is somebody that I knew from New York um, who relocated to Providence. And, you know, he's a, he's kind of a polarizing figure. He's, he's like kind of the mayor of the Bell street dog park at this point. Um, and, you know, he was, he was like a dandy, like, if you know that term, he was like this very, like, dapper. I would say that's a, actually a, the best, most accurate term for that gentleman. Yeah, yeah. It would be that. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's this, like, very uh, dapper, uh, sophisticated guy who's a bit older than the rest of us. Um, 
and I just loved the idea of having him like kind of be the host. Um, and then Jesse kind of hired uh, um, Cassie, who became like our other opening bartender, who you know is a dear friend to this day. And you know, so it was just like kind of organic, like who who can fill in these blanks, who wants to fill in these blanks, and then that's how we started. And then you know, over time, it developed into a more traditional approach to hiring, where you're where you're listing that you're hiring and that you're looking for people who have skill sets that match what you need done and have, um, you know, temperaments and, uh, you know, and other, whatever other cons considerations that make them a good fit for the place. So you've got your, got your staff, mm -hmm. you've got your, you know, your paperwork all in order mm -hmm. and it's been rehabbed. And what I want to ask is like something that, you know, friends that I've taken to the place have noticed is that Cortland Club has its own unique like look and feel to it. Uh, like the lighting is crazy, some of the vintage glassware, like you know, even beyond just like the the building itself, like in the rehab work you put in. What informs like that aesthetic of Cortland Club and like how many things are considered cuz I think sometimes, you know, people walk into a bar and they're like, oh, there's glass, but like, like everything seems to be very intentional and very informed in like working in concert together. Mm -hmm. And was that more something that developed over time, or was that from like the get go? You were like, nope, we're gonna get these specific lights and these kind of glasses and this kind of thing because sure. I have a certain vision. Somewhere in between, um, yeah, everything in there is very intentional, and you know, I'm definitely been accused um, of of being a particular person. <laughs> Um, I say it works for Cortland Club, so yeah, and, and it does. It's you know, it's most of our strengths are also our you know, our weaknesses or whatever. But no, I mean, it, it's mostly a strength. I think that if there's any weakness, it's spending too much time and a little like obsessing a little too much on some details. But that's you know how you end up where you want to. So yeah, it was all kind of so basically the the design elements that and and I don't have any formal design training, but I've always been, you know, just captivated and drawn to design particularly interiors and um you know collected books along those lines for years and learned some more practical stuff as with the some of the um property restorations i was doing and so as we kind of demoed the place out the things that emerged as like really worth keeping were that brick wall with the ovens the exposed joist ceiling which had been you know both of these things were hidden and um by like like I said, drop ceilings and wall paneling, and then the like kind of slat um, horizontal beadboard walls. So those are the three things we kept. And then you know it was th there's there's a uh, you need to find a marriage between the like aesthetic considerations and the functional considerations. So it's like all right, well you need to make a layout of where like the seats are going to be and where the bar is going to be and where all the where the kitchen is going to be in the bathroom and and all of the you know equipment and, and various things that have to be there. So it's like, all right, you identify what you need, you identify the space you have, and then you find a way to do to to lay it out that makes the most sense, and then you kind of um, choose your materials and, and things to kind of make it look the way that you want to. Um, so that's what we did, and I worked with some kind of uh, guys who I met through a mutual friend on it, and then by way of that, you know, people talk about the lighting a lot. It's a guy named Christopher Forgus, who's definitely a Providence art scene fixture. He, I believe he's in New York now, but um, he's known for, for music and he's known for um, comics that he makes. And um, he he designed, he was doing these, a lot of like paper folding stuff. So the, the idea was that he would do the light fixtures. So all, so the, the light fixtures, um, are all handmade by Christopher and they were this, you know, special kind of paper that he uh, scored and folded and, you know, put the LED uh, element inside of and, you know, had to put like fire retardant coating on it so it would, the fire department would thumbs it up. Originally the idea was, was going to be this whole crazy like circuitous snaking thing that was going to take over like most of the ceiling and then we kind of realized that it was a bit much both aesthetically and labor wise so we we you know zeroed in on what we ended up going with but that's that so that's handmade the um 
the leather chairs in there I found on New York Craigslist. They came out of the uh, Kenneth Cole corporate headquarters um, conference room. Um, the two... It's uh, like a crazy uh, random find. Yeah, the um the the black metal stools in there came from like a like a salvage warehouse in um somewhere in Brooklyn. Um the the teak um like tabletops like in that front banquet and in the like other like little modular tables around. Um I, I bought that teak plywood from Seth at Machines with Magnets. That was like old dead stock ply that his dad had from back in the day um the the two tables that are like directly across from the bar that see like four or five people those are actually one table that i bought and sawed in half to make it the two tables oh, so you were you were just doing a lot of like all right let's make this work let's make the these things like work together yeah and i don't know it's like it's um it thing vi- these things just make sense to me in a way that's hard to articulate so it's it's definitely one of my strengths is kind of outfitting spaces and and these things that are n- not necessarily necessarily obvious to go together like i just it, it made sense to me so we just kept chipping it away oh the, the i don't know if you've ever noticed the bar itself not the bar top but the bar is wrapped in shoe in leather and that's um that was, that was something i know i'm like like i was always wondering i'm like is this is this leather or like boot what is up it's boot leather so so um Andrew Murphy, who was one of the guys who was working on the build out with me, um, I think it was him. Actually, it might have been this guy, Jean Nick, um, had, I think, yeah, it was him. It was Jean Nick by way of, you know, working, whatever program he was doing at RISD, had come to meet this guy in Fall River who sold leather that was like um, excess from like jobs for bigger companies like L.L. Bean or Timberland or whatever. So there's this amazing leather warehouse. And we went there and I was just going there to buy leather for, you know, the, the banquet, the two, like the banquet up in the front corner and the banquet in the back room. So we were just going to buy a little bit of leather. But for some reason, this guy, this guy had stacks of this, you know, really firm black boot leather. And he's like, this has been sitting here for, I think I just commented on how it was cool. It's like, this has been sitting here for years. Nobody wants it. I have nothing to do with it take it if you want it so we took it and originally we were talking about doing leather walls in the bathroom which i'm so glad we wouldn't do because that just sounds disgusting that just sounds like a horrifying like when you have to clean that it also yeah it also sounds like some like i don't know like snm because that's a very different type of house yeah exactly anyway so we took that and we saw yeah the you know next time you're in check it out that's it's leather surrounding the bar and then you know with wood wood accents and granite bar top this network of people that that you were working with because it just put the question in my head like did you already did you and jesse like already know all these people or were like you finding and meeting these people as you were like building this thing up i mean i've been so lucky throughout my life um and i guess open-minded helps in terms of just meeting people that that facilitate like you know where we facilitate each other's kind of interests and and skill sets and the way that I met the guys who ended up um uh you know doing the bulk of the build out was just they were at a barbecue at, like at my friend's house and I just kind of was conversationally telling them about what I was working on and they're like oh that sounds cool can we come see it and they came over and saw it and then they ended up just getting involved so Everything aesthetically inside is curated, but beyond that, there's other sections such as the food and drink is very carefully selected and curated. Mm -hmm. Do you, like, at that time or maybe even now, do you consider yourself a food and drink aficionado or is that just more personal taste? Uh, I mean, I really, I really enjoy food and drink a lot. Like, I get, you know, eating cooking and eating are some of the main delights in my life um but i'm not making those menus um you know the the opening menu i i had some part in you know designating what some of the dishes were and a couple of those things are still on like the house pizza with the kind of japanese influenced pizza with the um mozzarella and furikake and white anchovy and um nori like that was my idea and was your idea the cast iron cookie 
So the cast iron cookie. So that is my favorite thing on that menu. That's so funny that you mentioned that. So um, I had a friend from elementary school who – this is so weird. I had a friend from elementary school that I also went to college with. And we were friends in elementary school, but we didn't really – you know, we weren't really in touch in college. We just happened to be there at the same time. But I had another close friend in college, and these two people ended up opening this um, cafe and catering company together in in Brooklyn. In um, what do you call it? It's not Red Hook. I guess it's. I guess it would be considered Carroll Gardens or Cobble Hill. So I used to. Um, I, I I ended up splitting my. T- bef- you know, especially before opening Cortland, I. After I was established here, I started splitting my time between New York and Providence. Um, and so I would go, like, you know, do my computer work and hang out at their cafe. And they had this chocolate, cherry, and black pepper cookie on the menu. Um, but it's not baked to order. It's not hot. It's not, it's just a cookie, but it was such, it was like my favorite cookie ever. So my friend Alex, she gave me the recipe and then we kind of modified it a little bit and you know we made it into like a more brownie consistency and and cook he you know baked it to order in those cast iron pans and um started serving it a la mode so it's kind of a you know development of you know this place was called, it doesn't exist anymore it's called canteen c a n t i n e um and that's so originally we were going to call it the canteen cookie uh you know to shout them out for basically stealing their cookie but you know once uh cast iron cookie had a nice serving ring to it the fact that it's like also served in the cast iron pan when you get it yeah, yeah. like it's crazy yeah. um so so but you, but to you answer your question food and drink yeah but it I wasn't inform- completely your decision yeah so the opening bar menu was totally jesse hedberg um drink the drink menu and the opening food menu was my concept of what I wanted to do, which was eclectic and took influence from lots of different cuisines. And then Robert Andriozzi, who's the other partner in Pizza Marvin, um, along with, you know, Richie, who was our cook, and I kind of um, developed what the menu was. And a lot of it was me being like, it would be cool if we did this. And it's like, we used to have what we called Clams Cortland, which was, um, you know, little necks that were stuffed with Portuguese sweet bread and alhiera, which is a Portuguese sausage and Calabrian chili. So a lot of it was like, I want this. And then Robert, like with his, you know, vast culinary experience, knowing how to do that. And then, and then, you know, as it developed over time, um, the, the people who have, you know, our chefs and the people who have operated the kitchen have kind of really taken the reins of, you know, guiding the menu. And some of those things remain and then some of them are new things. Um, and, you know, they're, they're generally interested in, in my input or feedback, but it's really their show. What goes into, even just from a standpoint of what beer gets on the menu and what spirits gets on the menu mm-hmm. and even like the newer cocktails that comes out, but especially the beer and spirits part because the spirits end up making the cocktails, right? And the reason why I asked that, um, again, I'm going to plug another episode. Uh, Jen, the beverage director of uh, the Eddy mm-hmm. and of Dirks. Go listen to that episode after this one. Uh, but she was breaking down to me, like, you know, even just dealing with distributors and talking with them mm-hmm. and getting access to X amount of bottles of something that you need. Like, that's a whole. So if, if you could just go into that for a little bit of like, hey, how do you, like, how do you find a beer that you, or a spirit that you're going to put on, you know, mm-hmm. put on the menu? How are you going to utilize in a cocktail? Like, what does that process look like? Who's in charge of it? And like, then like the logistics of buying it, like, w- what all goes into play there? Yeah. So to, you know, there's distributors, like you said, and to open up an account with them, you know, you have to to give them a credit application with references and this and that. Um, And they, each one is responsible for distributing different spirits or beers or wine in the region. Um, And, you know, when we opened, Jesse kind of put that menu together. Um, And it's very interesting too, because it's, it's like, beet juice in this it's like stuff you wouldn't think about and sure. it, it makes all the sense in the world when you taste it right so beet juice that's the mother Teresa's are the only cocktail from our original menu that's still on the menu um and that's you know a favorite of people for sure and that's mezcal beet juice cassis campari uh rose water um and gold edible gold stars on top so that's that's i think a place where jesse and i really um, found common ground was this notion of playfulness. Um, you know, he really likes alliteration in names of drinks, you know, 
Japanese julep or or lupini martini rhymes. That was my that actually that was the one drink that was my idea, lupini martini, um, and you know these other things are, are there. So a lot of it was the idea was we're gonna do forward thinking twists on classic cocktails, and then you know since then we've had uh, I believe three beverage directors now, including Jesse. So whoever's in that position, who right now is Laura Gancy. Shout out Laura, one of my favorite human beings of all time. She, um, you know, that's her program. She, um, she decides what uh, beer, wine, and spirits to buy based on what our distributors are offering. You know, the spirits kind of usually stay the same unless there's a new product that comes to market. The availability of beers changes like every week, um, particularly in like this the craft world. Um, and yeah, that's and then Laura like you know has comes up with cocktails and that's it. Uh, you know, I, and she, you know, by working with somebody who's so capable and 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 creative, um, and that I have so much faith in, it allows me to focus more on other things like the programming at the bar. You know, so like Noah and Julia in our kitchen got food covered. I have nothing to worry about. Um, Laura has the beverage program covered. And then we, you know, our, our staff is all just very like, it's, it's so, I feel, I'm so grateful for the people that we have working there. It's, it's the best team we've ever had. And just everybody brings like good energy and good work to the table. So having that comfort and confidence allows me to focus on broad strokes, things like the programming of what we're doing, where, you know, we've become definitely more music focused or, you know, special events we're doing. Or, oh, I've got some questions about that coming up. Absolutely. Or, or, you know, private events that people book, you know, it's, it's touching that people want to have, um, you know, celebrate kind of a landmark birthday or a small wedding or, or whatever it is at our place. Cause they could go anywhere and, and spend that money and, and spend that time. And they, um, they choose us. So yeah, I, I think that, by having by knowing who's good at what and letting them do what they're good at and then me just folk knowing what i'm good at which is kind of like ideas and and execution of certain things like we all just there's there's a harmony to that was it a little brief side question because i you were talking talking earlier mentioning earlier about how like you obsess over certain details was it hard to give that control at first or was that just more like more like it naturally happened or you were just knowing like hey this is my wheelhouse just please take care of this i got faith in you um both you know it's i think it depends who you're working with but if somebody um inspires confidence in you then and then you and and you know they're good at what they do and that's why they're there then you know you'd be kind of dumb to not yeah just let them <laughs> do it so but yeah it's it's um you know there's a lot of there's a lot of intangibles and, you know, personality goes into it, work ethic goes into it. Communication is so crucial, you know, it's a cliche, but it really is. Um, so, yeah, I try to do what I'm good at and um, empower and facilitate the other people involved in doing what they're good at. And then speaking of the food and drinks, I definitely want to get into the programming in a little bit. Um, one question I have is how do you – and maybe this is up to whoever ends up being the beverage director or in charge of food at the time. But I've noticed that there is this balance of like playfulness when it comes to the food and drink, really high quality, but then also not necessarily like dumb, expensive or pretentious. Hmm. Like you, you guys like hit this certain type of sweet spot where it's like, this is not the most expensive. Like I'll just take rum for example. It's not the most expensive rum in the world we have, but we have it for this reason, or we have these yeah. rums for these reasons. Um, this is not the most expensive beer, but we got these beer for these reasons, and they all work together in concert, and they all like teeter that fine line. Is that something that it's just the beverage directors like really, really know, or is that something from the get go? Like we're gonna we're gonna kind of be in this like really sweet spot. Sure. Really curious about that. So yeah, I mean, you know, there's intentionality there too, and it's almost like a template where it's like. You know, we now that we, you know, we kind of establish an identity where, you know, right, there's a balance between elegance and playfulness. And, you know, we're not ma interested in making things inaccessible for people. So it's like, all right, if you look at the beer list, then the the idea is that we're picking things that are sound cool and unique that ideally aren't available everywhere but are good examples of whatever they are and that uh comprehensively make like a beer list that if you 
you know, if, if you're a drinker of sours or if you're a drinker of double IPAs or porters or whatever it is, that we have something that fills, that, that's going to check any one of those boxes. Um, and then, yeah, same thing with the spirits. It's like, yeah, I mean, we want to have a few different kind of rums that have different characteristics that will appeal to different palates and, and make more sense for, um, you know, the flavor profile of a cocktail they might be used in. So talking about programming, because you have this history within music and also within photography, um, from a programming standpoint, you know, we talked about the aesthetic, the interior, we've talked about, um, you know, even things like glassware and details like that and the food and drink are covered. Was the idea of programming and doing more music and music forward stuff from the get go, or was it something that evolved? It evolved. Um, you know, we've had a music, you know, like, like we've talked about, has been a big part of my life always. Um, and so when we did the build out, we built in a DJ booth, um, but it didn't get that much use for the first couple of years. It got a little use, you know, it has a lid on top. So once in a while we pop the top off and play some records or whatever, but, you know, quarantine and shutdown and whatnot gave me a lot of time to evaluate you know, what was working and what wasn't and, and what ways I might like to grow. Um, and, you know, I just kind of one day was like, I really want to bring more focus to the music element. And um, so I just made the decision that, you know, we, we closed from, you know, there was the initial closure when everybody closed and then we reopened and it was like a whole takeout thing. And then we closed, I think, December 13th of 2020 indefinitely because it didn't make sense for to be open because, you know, nobody, people weren't making enough money and, you know, the, the world was, the, you know, you were there. Um, so <laughs> we, we, we all were. <laughs> we were all there. So, you know, we shut down from December to May. And so... Um, it gave me a lot of time to think about a lot of things. And one was just that I really wanted to ramp up the music focus upon return. Um, and not so much like book DJs to get people in the door because they want to see the DJ, but more like I want to have DJs almost every night to make for a more dynamic experience for the people that are going there. And so I think that perfectly leads into this question. Um, do you think things get overlooked by either people visiting or people in the business as far as like what goes into like a good bar experience. And like, just to give you an example, um, friend and I, we were at, I think it was, I think it was Royal Bobcat, another good bar. Mm -hmm. Um, and the playlist they had on, it was kind of ridiculous, but because the people behind the bar ridiculous in a good way, like it had everybody laughing their ass off and it made that bar experience, you know, that much better because not only were the drinks good, like it kind of like the vibe in the room, like changed and it just made it a memorable night. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for you, I know music's important and you were talking about like, it adds to like the experience of the bar itself. Do you think that whether it's somebody who is you know, as like a patron or somebody who's starting a bar, do you think that gets overlooked sometimes is like, Hey, there's other intangibles besides like the food and drink being really good. Like, yeah, you got to have that good, but there's other things that add to the experience. And do you think that that gets overlooked? Uh, maybe by some people. I mean, I think that the way that I went into um, figuring out what Cortland club was, was to just make the place I wanted to hang out and with hopes that other people would want to hang out there too. Okay. Gotcha. So it's like, you know, there's an awareness, like, you know, if it, you know what you like when you go out. So you know yeah. that you like a place to feel a certain way and look a certain way and, you know, a certain level of hospitality and, and the, the food and the drink offerings. And so it's like, uh, sure, I think people get over – I would say it's more like people don't realize how much goes into um, some of the things that they're – I hesitate to say taking for granted, but um, the aspects of the experience don't – uh, are not coincidental for the most part. Like there's, there's work, there's intentional, there's work that's going into that. For you, like, so you have all these ingredients and these things coming together and you're running the business and you've had to deal with things like COVID. What for you, was it a certain night? Was it opening night? Was there some point where you're like, 
oh shit, this thing's real. Like this thing's real. It's generating cash. Like it's like, you know, yeah. Like you could say something is a real business on your opening night, but like, was there a certain point for you? Like, oh, this thing is like a, like it's become like a real thing, like a place where people want to go and it's making money and it's got staff and it's, it's become like a part Mm -hmm. of like the neighborhood and of like the food and cocktails and things going on in, in the city. Well, I think, I think there's been more than one. I mean, you just touched on something that's, still my favorite thing is when people come there for the first time and you know expect one or like don't know what to expect from being outside and then walk through the door and kind of get wide-eyed by like the surprise of what's on the other side of the door so that never gets old and that's super gratifying every time um but yeah i think there's been different milestones um and yeah, it doesn't need to be a big moment. It could just be like a kind of very present moment where it's like looking around and being like, like I said, you know, my point was to make a place that I wanted to hang out with hopes that other people would so that if I'm in there and it just like, it feels good in there and I look around and there's people having a good time and like being really present and like um, really enjoying themselves. And it's like that is a recurring moment where it's like, this is a real thing. Like that, that, that was the simple premise under which this was started and it um it it fulfills that um intentions intangibles and details i remember a quote from comedian chris rock where he said I've had $2 hot dogs with great friends, and those meals were better than $100 plates at fancy restaurants with awful people. The reason why I mention this quote is because your place could have high-quality food or drinks, but if the music, the staff, or just general ambiance is off, well, the experience of your guests will suffer. When you walk into Cortland Club, you get a feeling of high quality, but at the same time inclusive and definitely not pretentious. And it's that feeling that makes you want to come back again and again. Yes, vibe and feeling are intangibles, but they are intangibles worth paying attention to if you want to be successful. And I think one of the reasons why Cortland Club is so successful is Jason is clear on his intention of what he wants Cortland Club to be. And that intention comes through in every detail. From food, to drinks, to lighting, to the nightly music programming. Every single detail, no matter how big or how small, has been thoughtfully considered. So pay attention to the intangibles, consider all the details, and have clear intention with everything you do. I think this perfectly leads into this question. Did that the idea of like, hey, I just wanted to make a place that I wanted to be at and like my friends wanted to be at, is that what intentionally, maybe unintentionally, just because I'm really curious about this? Because I think people like they start businesses, but sometimes they forget or they don't think about brand building. Mm-hmm. And I think Cortland Club, not just as a place, but as like a brand when it comes to like everything so considered, like it's a well built brand with like a very defined brand story and there's like stories within stories Mm -hmm. and hopefully this is helping helping with that story this episode right here um what went into that brand building or was it just very natural because it was all from that like i'm i want a place where i want to hang out uh it was evolutionary um and i mean i guess in terms of a all right so our only marketing really is instagram um for better or for worse and so I think the first kind of branding that happened in terms of raising awareness and trying to get people to come was to find visual representations of, you know, what our place was. So just try to get nice pictures that captured it and that like kind of, you know, towed that line of elegance and playfulness that, um, you know, transported somebody to what the experience was as best as a picture can 
And then just keep chipping away at that over and over because you need to keep having it to keep reminding people like, hey, we're here. You got to come over here. So it's just like after a while, it starts to make more sense because, you know, it takes on a life of its own. And, you know, speaking of that, you got to keep reminding people. I think one thing, too, is that there is, you know, in, in this city of Providence, there is a good amount of food and bar and mm-hmm. cocktail competition, good competition. Sure. Um and I think there's one thing, and this is just my humble opinion, that Providence like punches well above its weight in mm-hmm. terms of like the quality of like restaurants and bars. Um, what do you think contributes to that? Like on uh, just uh, from like the city level, and you know, do you think that Providence is still kind of a secret for like for those who are like visiting the city? Like, they is it still that way? Or do you think it's getting more well known that now that like Providence is like a food and drink city? Well, I mean. The obvious answer is Johnson and Wales. Um, having the campus here, you know, culinary just kind of like is essentially an incubator for um, for that talent to, you know, they're already here and they can still be, you know, doing that course of study while they're working or or stay after they're done. So I think that's the, the big obvious one. Um, and do I think it's a secret? I mean... Mm, I, you know, we've, I guess there's been press and, you know, it's been, I think that the, the smaller city or the second cities have really emerged in the past few years. I think this was already happening. There were already people that were visiting or, or moving from places like New York and Boston because they felt priced out or they felt like they couldn't be a homeowner there. They couldn't be a business owner or whatever it was. So it's like, all right, I'm going to go to Providence. It's more convenient has a lot of the same amenities is right on 95 and um i can have a much higher quality of life there that was already happening and then with covid then there was i think an you know increase in that kind of relocation um because people are like well i want to have a yard or like something that you couldn't have in these other places um so and then with that comes also you know, travel, people visiting to check the place out to see what they think of it or visiting their friends who are here. And yeah, I think that people know. And I think it's also like, I think it, it also gets a little romanticized because if you come here for uh, um, for for a long weekend, then you can leave <laughs> with this really like, uh, you know, uh, this, this ta- you know, you, and you, you managed to have a good meal everywhere you, you went and you saw this like, charming architecture and, and you know this that and the other and it's like oh well yeah so you left and, and you got the best of it and if you stayed for a couple of weeks you would just go back to the same places I feel, it's small i remember like a friend of mine like his his wife at the his wife to be at the time um now you know wife uh, x amount of years but like she saw the river in downtown and saw the gondolas and she's yeah. like what the hell like yeah. she's like this is insane no like she's like yeah. it was like and but you're right They're like but if you see it every day i'm just like yeah whatever yeah. it's the i gotta walk over this bridge she's like no like there's like cobblestones here yeah. and there's like rivers and all this crazy right. i'm like great whatever like are we going to this bar what are we doing but yeah it's it's a perception thing too mm-hmm. which is actually speaking of perception oh, um, before you go away from that yeah, yeah. it's like that's also like something to think on because it's like all right well you know uh, on one hand, right, it's like you get used to these things. On the other hand, are we taking for granted our our kind of the things that we have? I don't know. That's actually a really good point. That's actually something uh, something to ponder right there. Um, trying to think of a line of question and go into that, but it's not coming to me. If it does, yeah. Uh, but you know, speaking of perception, though, mm-hmm. so in the city and you know within the food and drink space, where do you think Cortland Club sits within all of that? Mm, I don't. I'm not even sure i know what you're asking i guess it's just like there are certain spots that are known as like hey this is just like it's a, it's a bar like hey this this bar is like a dive but it's a really good dive this bar is really good it's known for like being mm-hmm. one of the first og cocktail bars. this mm-hmm. bar is known for this what do you think the perception is or what what do you want the perception of Cortland club to be within like the food and like what do you think it offers that like other bar would not offer or another mm-hmm. restaurant wouldn't be able to offer I don't know that we offer anything uh, tangible or specific that other places. I mean, th- if we're going literal, it's that we have different things on our menu mm-hmm. that you know that it it looks different and that we have different programming. But there's no tangible difference. It's just like if it resonates with you, if you like the space, if you like how it feels to be there, that's what makes us different. That's it. 
Gotcha. And then speaking of the city, mm-hmm. um, I can't tell you how many times I'll like see like a more like in a business related, like a business related like publication about how like can't tell you how many times like Rhode Island would get like ranked like one of the worst states to do business in or something like that. Yeah. And as somebody who's doing business in the state and doing business in the city of Providence, are there certain difficulties doing business in the city of Providence and in the state of Rhode Island that are just like unique to Providence in the state of Rhode Island and it's what hard. what were some of them if if, you, if yeah. you don't mind going into them? No, I don't mind at all. It's a, I mean it's hard for me to answer because I know the Providence stuff, but I I don't know the stuff in other cities, so gotcha, I, I yeah. don't know what what what's unique here. But there's there's hoops to jump through. I mean, you know, um, the the board of licensing has has been very fair to us over the years for the different times we've needed to have hearings for whatever. But when I first started. Um, I applied for what was called a class D liquor license, which is a social club liquor license. And there were like 30 of them in existence. And the reason why I did that was because I thought that was the most appropriate thing for us because of the social club history of the building and the, the location in the residential neighborhood. And the only real difference I think was the cost of the license. And I think maybe you have to close at midnight and, probably a couple other little things but so i put together this whole very you know this whole presentation because i wanted a yes and not a no on the liquor license and so i had the hearing and they're like you know this all sounds great but we don't give those out anymore like just apply for the regular liquor license just apply oh yeah just apply for the class b liquor license which is what you know a place like a much bigger place like ogie's like has that license or, or most bars have that license so i had to start the process over and you know to to apply to have a hearing for a liquor license they need to advertise the hearing for x amount of weeks in the newspaper and so it's like you know that was whatever that i don't know what the front to back timeline on is but say it's six six weeks or whatever so i had to start that over just book to find out like oh we don't give that out anymore uh, which which maybe you know I, maybe they could have told me when they saw the application but um so you know there's um that kind of thing um you know, Rhode Island is not known as a very f- business friendly place uh, as far as like tax considerations go. Um, and I don't know, there's some like kind of antiquated th- things in place that don't really serve anybody that maybe somebody will take a look at at some point and be like, hold on, who does this serve? What's the point of this? And if they can, if there may be, if they, if they don't see any purpose or, or service in it, maybe that'll, you know, change eventually. Were there any business difficulties that you weren't expecting either from the start or like the continuation of doing business now? Like anything that ended up becoming like a pain in the ass that you're like, I, that you didn't expect? Like, huh, I didn't know like this type of paperwork or this type of thing would be like such a pain I mean, to deal with. There's probably so many of them that I'm having trouble accessing at the moment. But, you know, it's just like things break, things need to be fixed and they don't do it at a time that's convenient. It's usually probably at the worst possible time. Uh, yes, usually yes, at the worst possible time. But you know, you have uh, running a bar, you have a, a restaurant, you have refrigerators, you have ice machines, you have um, you know cooking equipment. Like all this stuff is broken with no notice and yes, no and indication. And upkeep and yeah, cleaning yeah. things and yeah, no indication. Like no, like oh, this is starting to like perform a little differently. Just sudden, like nope. And it's like okay, well, you got to pivot. You know, we had. Um, we have a you know a glass washer like a high like a high speed or, or yeah high speed and high temp dish washer and sanitizer sanitizing machine in our bar um because we're going through a lot of volume of glassware and one friday it just decided it didn't want to work anymore so we had to manually wash and sanitize every glass um and i did that so it's like i think i was maybe gonna hang out with a friend that night or something but instead i you know set up shop and got my fingers all pruny and you know washed and sanitized every glass so yeah the, anything can happen at any time actually that's give me a good question to ask like uh try to find the right way to word this but i think sometimes what no matter what the type of business is that sometimes people they think like oh i'm gonna start this business and at some point I, I like it'll it'll generate cash and then like it'll become passive income. Um, 
and I'm not saying that that is either right or wrong, but how, from your experience, like how involved did you want to be in the business and your level of involvement as far as like, you know, the micro versus the macro, I guess, like, like, did you realize like, Oh, I'm going to be involved like this much at this level. Or were there other times where like, you got involved in certain things. You're like, Oh, I didn't think I'd be doing this. I think it, it takes different shapes at different times. I think at first, like I wanted to be around cause I was excited about it and cause I had a lot to learn and, and whatnot. And, you know, then I learned like what to not get in the way of also. And yep. then, um, y- you know, my role has changed. It, a lot of it has to do with how we're staffed. I mean, there's been time, there's been times where we had a, a gap between, um, when our previous chef needed to move on to their next thing. And when our next one was able to start because they, you know, gave reasonable advance notice to their prior employer and that you know in the past i've tried to like have pop-ups to fill up those spaces or, or something to that effect you know if so, but there was a period of i think it was definitely one week maybe two that i was the cook and it was uh you know i like cooking and I'm, i think i'm pretty good at it but i don't have but you know cooking professionally for other people is a whole different thing than having a dinner party at your house um, so yeah. And you know, there's been times when we're short staff, so I'm just in there washing dishes all night. Like I've played every role in that room except for making cocktails. Which I'm, I'm guessing you're like, oh, didn't, didn't know I'd be cooking. I'd be, I'd be I didn't know cooking I'd for be, this many people this yeah, night. I didn't know I would be, you know, serving. I didn't know I'd be cooking. I didn't know I'd be washing dishes. I didn't know, you know, but you know, it's also, it's good to do those things and to kind of know how to do things and to learn things and to understand what the, the role entails for the people that are usually doing it. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's a little bit of muscle building in it. This ability to pivot because, you know, COVID happens, you had, you had to pivot doing like takeout cocktails, something breaks, you have to pivot, um, staff, you know, changeovers, you have to pivot, uh, and it seems like you've been able to pivot in any given situation pretty well. What do you think contributes to that? And how important do you think any business, regardless if it's a bar or a restaurant or just any business of any type, have to be agile enough to be able to pivot in any given situation? Yeah, I mean, to me, like the things that come to mind are resilience, resourcefulness, and imagination. I mean, it's like the resilience comes into play by just like, you know, having the fortitude to keep it, keep going. The resourcefulness is kind of like taking stock of, you know, what you have access to or or what you might do and what might resonate with people. And and then, you know, that ties into the imagination behind it too, is like, all right, well, how are we going to make this fun and cool and interesting? Yeah. I mean, you talk about pivoting, like when, when, you know, once we reopened after the initial COVID closure, we kind of became an ice cream parlor. Uh, we were, we were, yeah, I didn't notice like the yeah. the ice cream was the thing. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. It was all takeout ice cream and cocktails and maybe pizza. Um, and basically, it was, we were already doing a little bit of ice cream to go with the cast iron cookie. And then, and we had, you know, kind of like this real like rinky dink little ice cream maker. And then, you know, as we were approaching reopening and it was you know, as like summer, I'm sorry, as spring was like leading to summer, it's like, well, and it was a time where it's like, all right, well, everybody's going to be outside because of the way the world is right now. And then um, takeout cocktails, cocktails got greenlit. So I was like, all right, well, we're going to do ice cream and cocktails because what's better for the summertime and like people coming up to the window. (laughs) So we, you know, found this used Carpigiani ice cream maker that makes really good ice cream and makes it really fast in, in, you know, in quantity larger quantities and we just you know i talked to my team and i was like here's what i'm thinking what do you guys think and they're like all right let's try it and so we um yeah we started making and selling ice cream and then with the cocktails we wanted to set ourselves apart by like kind of doing you know fun and playful and interesting things with the presentation and packaging on it and then so we did that and then and then when it made sense we started doing outdoor seating and then when it felt like it made sense we started doing indoor seating again which then didn't felt like it didn't make sense so then we just closed for a while um 
so yeah pivoting is is essential and it's like well you know stubbornness or inflexibility or a refusal or inability to pivot is going to get you stuck and then sometimes unfortunately left behind and left behind what advice would you give to even if somebody's wanting to open a bar or do what you did or just any creative or even your former self, like what have you learned throughout all this? Mm -hmm. They like, Deb, I wish I would have known this in the beginning or like it would have been so helpful. Like what advice would you give uh, knowing what you know now? Yeah, well, I think it's um, very situational and circumstantial. And I think that if, if somebody valued my input enough that they wanted advice, I think that I would probably start by trying to get the clearest understanding I could of what they were doing and that would directly input um, influence what the advice was I don't think there's blanket advice but for example when Jesse and Robert decided they were opening Marvin and then they you know asked me to come over to kind of consult on a you know give them my two cents on a few things you know my main the first thing I said was don't do it like that was my main advice I was like I love you guys and I, don't, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy like don't do this and I was so wrong because they're killing it. Like I, their their pizza's great, and they're doing well, and they're getting an amazing response. So they knew, um, they knew that it was a good idea. And I think that's the bigger lesson: is to trust yourself. I think is a big one. You have to be your own biggest advocate. Um, you need to be as well informed as possible in what you're doing. Um, you need to be willing to consider perspectives other than your own. And there's no right or wrong answer or like no specific avenue to like to success um but i think you know the thing i think trying to understand the best you can before you get started what exactly it is you're getting into what the commitment is what the sacrifice is you know what the logistics and, and sustainability and feasibility of it might look like like the more you can kind of know in advance um will help you arrive at the answer as to whether it's worth doing. What do you think the future holds for you and for Cortland Club and like, you know, there's what are you excited for down the road? Um, you know, there's some things that I that I want to do. So, you know, this is something I was asking myself recently is like, well, what what's next? And, you know, for uh, a minute I was like, well, I don't know if there's anything I can do here that I haven't already done. I can do like more of the same, like a little different, but, um, but I don't, and then I started thinking about it more and I realized that, that there's plenty of things I can do. Um, you know, there's some of which I'm not really ready to talk about cause they're not flushed out enough as ideas to even make sense. But, um, there are things I'm excited about, but yeah, I mean, I think one of them is like, as we've been doing, um, the immediate ones are, are, as we're focusing on the music programming, it's been like a real privilege and pleasure to bring, um, you know, performers and artists to town that had never been here before or that you wouldn't normally get to see in, um, in such an intimate setting. Like when we had Diamond D come do a DJ set as part of our fourth anniversary um, festivities in late October or um you know Edan came and, and played in December and you know that's somebody who saw I saw the knew. Edan set and that was, that was crazy yeah and that's somebody and you know there were people there that were like so thrilled that they couldn't believe this was happening and then obviously and then there were people there who like had no idea who this guy was but were feeling it um and that you know that's somebody who I I know from 20 years ago for from doing music um or yeah so so that kind of thing so i want to do more of that i want to bring more um people like that here and um you know i'm excited to have you know when we we opened this patio in in august um so we only got like the tail end of the season to enjoy it so i'm excited to have a full year or, or full like spring summer fall season of being able to make use of that and like kind of create some programming that really lends itself to to use of that space um you know, I'm I'm excited to figure out more ways to kind of engage in community and, and mutual aid. And, you know, that's something that we really try to bring focus to during COVID by, you know, kind of just fundraising for organizations whose missions, you know, resonated with us as important. Um, so that's something that we want to continue to do. And uh, I felt like there was one other that just popped in my 
rapidly moving brain but um you know those are some of them and then kind of like just some ideas for like different kinds of program that we haven't done before that um I, I would love that you know on some level feel a little ambitious but things i'd like to figure out and figure out how to do all right so we're at the end and not really gonna be any more questions from me but what i'm what i always like to do is just whatever you want to say, whatever messaging you want to put out, anything you want to promote, anybody you want to shout out, the the floor is yours before we wrap it up. So anything you want to leave on, go for it. Ooh, uh, this, this is hard. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I feel incredibly fortunate um, and to, you know, to have, to be able to do what, th- these things that I've done and, and to, to do something that resonates with people and brings people together. And, um, I, you know, I just, you know, Providence is a special place. Um, and I, I would just really encourage everybody to try to be like kind and decent to each other and, and supportive. You know, there's kind of that old adage about Rhode Island or Providence being like kind of like crabs in a barrel. You know, and um, I've, I've discussed that adage on a couple of different episodes on this show. So I know what you're talking about, you know, and, and I've, I've seen it to be true and I've seen it to be false. I've experienced great kindness and consideration from people who I hardly know. And I've also had people hate on me who don't know me at all. And, you know, that can happen anywhere. But Providence is where we are. And it's a, you know, relatively small city. And um, I'm not competing with anybody. Um, except for myself, which also sounds cliche and corny as hell, but there's some truth to it. And um, I would say that there's room for all of us. So it's like, you know, just let's uh, let's all be let's all be good to each other. Let's all do good things. Let's encourage each other. And and um, that's how we, I think, make this the best creative capital that it can be. Uh... You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna end it on that. <laughs> we're gonna. I think that was a perfect way to end it. So with that, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. And uh, until next time. And that's it for this episode of the Creative Capital Show. Thank you for listening. And a special thanks goes to this episode's guest, Jason Sheckman. The Creative Capital Show is hosted, recorded, and produced by me, Jason Sylvia, with audio editing and mixing by Anthony Ferreira. You can listen to The Creative Capital Show over at our website, creativecapitalshow.com. We're also available on Anchor FM, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast hosting platforms. If you like the show, please subscribe. Helps the show out a lot. And be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the show, and until next time, keep on creating.